Good morning. Welcome to the Brookings United Church of Christ. Good to see you all here this morning, as well as those joining us on uh, Facebook Live as, as well. And so we're going to begin our worship service as we do each week with a few announcements, um, which Miss Mona will share with us at this time. Good morning. So the cause of the month, we're going to be taking treats to the school, Madari Elementary. It's a new school in an old location. Anyway, so next Sunday, there's going to be cards distributed that we will sign, and you can bring them back the following Sunday so we can deliver them with the bars that you're going to bring the following Sunday. So it's a two-for thing. Okay. <clears throat> the grief share continues. Please let people know if they would like to attend. You do not have to register. It's 5.30 to 7.30 on Sunday. And that would be today. Farmer's Market, please sign up if you can help at the Farmer's Market. Something to chew on <clears throat> Wednesday at 6.30 with a potluck. Everyone is welcome. Conversation and coffee. Please join us Tuesday from 10.30 to 11.30 at the Cottonwood Cafe downtown. Don't forget to turn in your high V receipts. And there's a sign-up sheet for worship help in September. Also, there's a flyer in the back, Hobo Day, coming up. Bum a meal. I'm not sure what that involves, but... Host for Hobos. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mona. And so at this time, I would invite you all to stand and join together in uh, our opening song of praise this morning. Build your kingdom here.
please remain standing for the call to worship this morning. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will cause a righteous branch to spring forth and bring my promised salvation to Israel. Christ is our righteousness. The days are surely coming, says our Lord, when justice and mercy will be executed throughout the land. Christ is our righteousness. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when my promised one will teach transgressors my ways and heal the world with love and mercy. Christ is our righteousness. Please take this moment to greet your neighbors this morning. You may be seated. This is the time in our worship service each week. We open it up. Open microphone time. Open mic morning. To uh, anything you want to lift up, ask for prayers from your brothers and sisters, anything uh, you are celebrating today. Uh, Mona has a microphone. If you raise your hand, she will find you. I want to lift up parents and uh, families and just... um, Thank God for for all the hardworking parents out there. I got to take care of my grandbaby on Friday in Spearfish. Both both are working parents, and um, just it's it's a lot. And so I just want to lift up families. Well, speaking of family, Rachel, do you have a joy to share with us? <laughs> all your family in the back row, yeah. Welcome. You enjoy the performance today. Okay. All right. Others, raise your hand. Mona will find you. What's happening this week? What are you celebrating? What have you been praying about lifting up? Oh, I thought I thought that was a hand over there. That was just a in your eye. Anything else? You are a quiet crowd today. All right. Well, let's come to the Lord then in a moment of uh, silent prayer, lifting up the things that I know are on uh, each of your hearts, uh, both in your personal life as well as in, in the world. Lift those things up to the Lord, and we'll come to the Lord in a moment of silent prayer. Almighty and merciful God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, both spoken and unspoken, and we entrust them all to you. We thank you for all the ways you have blessed us and and guided us. Through Christ, you have taught us to love one another, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and even to love our enemies. So in these times of violence and fear. God, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts so that we might not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Help us to see each person in the light of love and grace that you've shown us through your Son, Jesus. Put away the nightmares of of terror and awaken us to the dawning of your new creation. Establish among us, God, a future where peace reigns, where justice is done with mercy, and where all are reconciled. We ask these things in the name of, of Jesus, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray a contemporary form of 
of his prayer as we say together, our Creator God, who reigns in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time, please join together as we sing hymn number 505, Sweet Hour of Prayer. join together in our unison prayer this morning, which is on the screens before you as well as in our bulletins. As disciples of Christ, we proclaim in our words the hope that we may all be one, yet often we become bound, even imprisoned by our fears or distrust of those whom seem different from us in some way. When our fears bind us, we forget our calling to be witnesses in the world of the love of God, manifest in Christ Jesus and in each of us. The fear of difference causes us to retreat and separate ourselves from others. The fear of difference imprisons us in cells of our own making. Merciful God, through Christ Jesus, you have taught us to love one another to love our neighbors as ourselves, and even to love our enemies. In times of violence and fear, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts so that we may not become overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Help us to see each person in light of the love and grace you have shown us in Christ. Put away the nightmares of terror, and awaken us to the dawning of your new creation. Establish among us a future where peace reigns, justice is done with mercy, and all are reconciled. Though we may be tempted to succumb to the battle against fear, we know in our hearts that the battle belongs to you. Guide us and defend us on our journey, we pray. Amen. And speaking of that, that term battle and what kind of battle we have to fight in this world um, is a battle of overcoming uh, fear and letting God fight our, our battles for us. And so this t- at this time, Rachel's going to uh, share this song with us, it's sung uh, by Phil Wickham. It's called The Battle Belongs.
Thank you, Rachel. That was beautiful. You got to be proud of that one, aren't you? Yeah. Amen. Right? So the scripture I'd like to share with y'all is uh, from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 20, verses 1 through 4 and 10 through 18. And I'm guessing you may never have heard uh, this scripture uh, preached on uh, during worship, and there's, there's probably good reason, but we're, we're going to un- unpack this one this morning. It says this, When you go out to fight your enemies, and you face horses and chariots, and an army greater than your own, do not be afraid. The Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt is with you. When you prepare for battle, the priest must come forward to speak to the troops. He will say to them, Listen to me, all you men of Israel. Do not be afraid as you go out to fight your enemies today. Do not lose heart or panic or tremble before them. For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies, and he will give you victory. As you approach a town to attack it, you must first offer its people terms for peace. If they accept your terms and open the gates for you, then all the people inside will serve you in forced labor. But if they refuse to make peace and Prepare to fight. You must attack the town. When the Lord your God hands the town over to you, use your swords to kill every man in the town. But you may keep for yourselves all the women, children, livestock, and other plunder. You may enjoy the plunder from your enemies that the Lord your God has given you. But these instructions apply only to distant towns, not to the towns of the nations in the land you will enter. In those towns that the Lord your God has given you as a special possession. Destroy every living thing. You must completely destroy the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. This will prevent the people of the land from teaching you to imitate their detestable customs in the worship of their gods, which would cause you to sin deeply against the Lord your God. So this morning, I'm in week number two of a series I'm entitling Living Fearless Lives. And in this this week's message, I'm going to discuss the issues of war, terrorism, violence, and crime. So I want to begin right out of the gate by saying that actually, 
you've never likely heard this uh, scripture in a, in a sermon, as, as I've said, maybe never even read it yourself at all before. But I think it's important to recognize all types of scripture that exist in our Bible and seek to grapple with it all. So as I was reflecting upon the content of this sermon, it, it occurred to me that much of the political rhetoric within our nation and around the world are based on irrational fears. And it is irrational fear that is the cause of much of the othering that we see around the world, which leads to division, destruction, and even death. So as I begin to unpack this morning's scripture, it's important that we don't attempt to understand it without first understanding the author, the intended audience, the purpose, the genre, and the context. So I'd like to begin by talking about this book of Deuteronomy. The, the word Deuteronomy itself is a Greek word meaning second law. But actually the book is not a second set of laws, but a copy or a repeating of the laws of Moses found in Exodus and Leviticus. And these books are all within the first five books of the Bible, which are referred to as the Pentateuch, another Greek word meaning literally five books. And these books are referred to in, the, in Hebrew as the Torah, meaning law or instruction. So let's begin, by, begin to unpack this passage by questioning the author. It's traditionally held to be Moses, but most contemporary scholarship has proposed that these first five books were compiled by at least four different authors over a several hundred year period. So I happen to, to subscribe to the latter view. So in that case, these books would have begun to come together during the period of Judges, before the reign of the first kings, Saul and David. And the intended audience were the descendants of the Israelites who participated in the exodus from Egypt. The purpose of the writing was to create a permanent record of the oral traditions, which reminded those descendants of the ancestry, as well as the laws of Mo that which Moses dictated to the Israelites. The genre of these books is mainly a historical narrative which was passed down from generation to generation and happens to include the law of Moses. And finally, it's most important that we understand the context of these books and in this morning's scripture in particular. You see, the ancient Hebrew people understood everything that happened to them and the world around them as being directed by their God. Therefore, they were terrified of displeasing Yahweh for fear that Yahweh would turn them over to their enemies. But at the same time, they were, they were also afraid of their enemies and their enemies' gods. The Israelites were a fear-based culture that relegated people of other religions, color, and ethnicities as the other and thusly perceived them as a threat. Does that sound familiar? Do we do the same thing within our culture and the world today? There is but one antidote to fear, and that is love. But we must make a choice. Did you know that the human brain expresses only two fundamental emotions, love and fear. From these two, all other emotions are experienced. As Christians, we're called to live in God's love. But how do we live in love or fear? Humans can have many types of fear. There's the fear of the unknown, pain, death, and fear of choices, just to name a few. When we live in fear, we react to instead of act against our fear. But when we love, we have excitement, generosity, trust, and courage. Love strengthens and empowers, whereas fear weakens and disables. Perfect love, like a light, casts out all fear. For it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Many times, our fears can be irrational. It's like believing in the boogeyman. 
The devil causes us to become fearful, but God is way bigger. When we give up our fears to God, we can live a full life in love that he has prepared for us. So which will you choose? Fear or love? So we as Christians are called to choose love over fear. But unfortunately, our spiritual ancestors, the Hebrew people, found fear to be a more powerful motivator than love. They were a tribal culture, and fear influenced how they interacted with their own tribes, but it, it dictated how they viewed those outside of their tribes. And so, of course, it's easy for us to dismiss these ancient people as primitive and uneducated, but an honest assessment of ourselves in this era would lead us to admit that we are still a tribal society today. We separate ourselves into the modern-day tribes of race, religion, gender, orientation, age, income, vocation, political party, among many others. And then we as Americans, and even us as Christians, tend to show more love to those within our tribes and tend to show more fear toward those outside our tribes. I recently read the story of a pastor who visited Africa on a mission trip and how the group had an opportunity to take part in the safari at the end of the trip. And he recalls the group staying next to a watering hole where dozens of species of animals, including giraffes and elephants and zebras and impalas, would gather to drink. He said it was awe-inspiring to watch those animals standing around the pools of water at sunrise and sunset. And he recalled that some of the animals they watched were quite calm as they drank, but others were terribly skittish. If they heard any kind of sound, they jumped back, prepared to run. Particularly fearful were the impalas, which had beautiful V-shaped horns and a distinctive mark on their hindquarters, a brown patch of fur in the shape of the letter M. So when the pastor asked the guide why these creatures were so skittish, the guide responded, that M you see on their hindquarters stands for McDonald's. They are the cheeseburger of the food chain here in the wild. They are on high alert, afraid, because so many other animals would gladly eat them. Like the Impalas, we often live on the edge, never quite sure who is friend or foe, or from which direction the next threat is likely to come. But there's a big difference. The predators we fear the most are not other species, but our fellow human beings. In a recent Gallup poll, 63% of Americans reported that they are somewhat or extremely concerned about being a victim of crime and violence. And this is way up from just 39% a few years ago, and it's the highest level since 9-11. And our fellow, fellow human beings we tend to fear the most are those who are different from us, those of other religions, races, ethnicities, and socioeconomic groups. The problem often begins with negative stereotypes that are based on distorted information, faulty assumptions, and mistaken beliefs. The story is told of a woman named Stephanie who grew up in a home where her mother was allergic to cats. When little Stephanie asked for a kitten, her mother told her that kittens make pe some people sick. When Stephanie persisted, her mother described the symptoms of cat allergies in graphic terms. People with allergies struggle to breathe when a cat's around, her mother said. They can get hives on their neck, chest, and face. Their eyes turn red and itch. For Stephanie, the prospect of so much misery ended her kitty dreams, but it also planted in her a deep fear of cats. So when Stephanie became an adult, her fear meant she avoided dating men who had cats. She would subtly ask about pets before she determined if she would see someone 
What if kissing or touching someone who had a cat made her sick? It was only after ending a relationship with a man to whom she was deeply drawn that a therapist helped her to see how her mother's words had shaped her fears. Together they researched how many people are actually allergic to cats, about one in ten, by the way, and they looked at symptoms and treatments and dispelled some misconceptions about cats left over from Stephanie's childhood. Then they added some exposure therapy. And slowly, Stephanie allowed herself to be around cats. And to Stephanie's surprise, she was not allergic to cats at all. And three years later, she bought the kitten she'd wanted when she was a child. Correcting her faulty thinking and working up the courage to test her assumptions set her free. Unfortunately, the ancient Israelites never allowed themselves to test their assumptions about their neighbors. And their neighbors didn't test their assumptions about the Israelites either. Thus, they only became enemies because they feared each other. And they only feared each other because they didn't know enough about each other. And ironically, they had to overcome their fear of being killed in battle before they could go out and kill their enemy whom they feared. Our scripture tells us that the priest would say to them, do not be afraid as you go out to fight your enemies today. Do not lose heart or panic or tremble before them. So it was this ongoing, circular motion of fear within ancient Israel and its neighbors. And because they assumed the worst about each other, which drove them to perpetrate acts of violence upon one another. And the same is true for the government of modern-day Israel. Since the inception of, of their nation in 1948, Israel's government has assumed that the Palestinian people are a threat to them. And this fear resulted in the Palestinians being basically imprisoned within their own land. And then, of course, over the course of decades, a few of them acted out violently, which only prompted more violence against them by the state of Israel. And we all know the most recent incident from last October, which has resulted in the deaths of around 1,500 Israelis, including some foreign nationals, along with over 40,000 Palestinians. And all of the death and destruction over all of these decades has occurred because of how some interpret scriptures like today's and their fear-based assumptions. And today, in America, our fears are being exploited for political gain. But the truth is, our fears are largely disconnected from reality. In the most recent year of statistics, approximately 21,000 murders took place in America. Now, this might seem like a frightening statistic at first, particularly when given no context. But in, uh, consider a recent report in a prominent medical journal estimating that more than 250,000 people die annually in U.S. hospitals due to medical error. And consider that you are actually twice as likely to die in a car accident in any given year than to be murdered. Yet most of us are not afraid to get into a car. So in those moments, when we do fear a situation, we should remember the acronym for addressing our fear. It is F, face your fears with faith. E, examine your assumptions in the light of facts. A, attack your anxieties with action. And R, release your cares to God. When we're fearful, we can find a great sense of peace by slowing down, meditating on Scripture, and listening for God to speak. An illustration of this is the 
story of Dr. Martin Luther King, who in January of 1956 was leading the Montgomery bus boycott following Rosa Parks' arrest for not giving up her seat on a bus to a white man. The boycott had been going on for weeks. But at, at midnight on January 27th, King received a threatening phone call telling him to leave Montgomery if he didn't want to die. He wrote that he was ready to give up. Weary from the fight, anxious and afraid, he bowed that night at the kitchen table and prayed, confessing his fear and exhaustion to God. It was then that he felt God's presence and heard an inner voice, the voice of the Spirit saying, Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for truth. And God will be at your side forever. His fears immediately dissipated. And he noted, I was ready to face anything. Of course, 12 years later, he did succumb to an assassin's bullet. But during those 12 years, he changed the course of history through the civil rights movement because he was able to overcome his fear. Many remember FDR as a great leader who summoned the courage of a nation in its darkest hours of the Depression, which saw as high as 25% of our people unemployed. And in his famous address, he stated the phrase, which is still remembered by nearly every American, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. However, just a decade later, after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1942, he would sign an executive order to forcibly relocate over 100,000 people of Japanese descent, most of them Americans, from their homes into internment camps. Sadly, in that moment, the man who summoned a nation to great courage lacked the moral courage to defend those who were being viewed as the other from the irrational fears of many in this country. And sadly today, we may be falling into the same trap. There are voices today who seek to lead this country telling us to fear those who speak a different language, who practice a different religion, who come from another country, or have a different skin color. In one of our closing verses, Moses is quoted as saying to the Israelites, you must completely destroy the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, just as the Lord has commanded you. And I believe that these words of Scripture have contributed to much of the dehumanizing of others that we see today. But you know what? I don't believe God ever commanded that. I believe Moses commanded that, and that he then attributed his words to God. We are all God's children. Every human that has ever walked this earth was created by God in God's own image. God desires us for us to love each other, not fear each other. So as you go from this place today, may you not succumb to fear mongering, but may you begin to view those who are different from you as having the face of Jesus and see them through the eyes of Jesus. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we, we admit that we are, are people who are often uh, fearful. Fearful of things that are different from us, that we don't completely understand. But Lord, uh, I just pray that we would follow the example of, of your son Jesus who went out into the world and uh, intentionally sought out people different 
than himself. People of different vocations, people of different religions, people of different socioeconomic status. And he sought to, sought to bring them together as one people and to call them to love one another as they love you, God. And so help us to walk through this life, to not succumb to the, the fears uh, that are so pervasive among us, but help us to live um, as your people and as you've called us to be people of love. Amen. And so at this time, uh, we are going to take a moment to share um, this table of celebration, this Thanksgiving of uh, the Eucharist, which Jesus first shared with his disciples in a place called the Upper Room. And we remember how in that room he took a loaf <clears throat> and he broke it. And he gave thanks to his Father in heaven. And he said to his disciples, take, eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took a cup and gave thanks to God, saying to his disciples, take, drink, this all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in the United Church of Christ, this table is open to all. We just welcome you to, to come forward and, and receive uh, this gift at the table. We do have um, actually gluten-free bread. If you would like that, just let me know as you, as you come forward, and we'll have a, a separate cup for, for that as well. At that, this time, I just invite Mona to come forward and assist me. And so the table is set. Come, receive.
So at this time, I would invite you all to stand once again as we sing our closing hymn this morning. It's number 575, O For a World. And we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 5. benediction. As you go from this place, may you indeed live in a world filled with peace and without fear. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.